Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by Kane University, where cougars climb higher. The Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care. TD Bank. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working for a healthier, more equitable New Jersey. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Choose New Jersey. MD Advantage Insurance Company. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, moving the region through air, land, rail, and sea. And by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by AM970 The Answer. And by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank right here on News 12 Plus. We're honored to kick off the program with a longtime uh, friend and colleague, Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, who is the chair of the Black Caucus, Legislative Black Caucus, and also the chair of what committee, Assemblywoman? The Community Development and Affairs Committee. Got it. Now, the Assemblywoman is in this uh, special edition of Think Tank, uh, as, along with some other guests. But Heavy focus in the interview we did with Assemblywoman Sumter is on Urban Matters, our series Urban Matters, in cooperation with Kane University and the John S. Watson Institute for Urban Policy and Research. Urban Matters matter because? Because it's important to the health and wellness of our entire state. It is the economic engine by which innovation occurs. And the Watson Institute has been instrumental in pulling those pieces together for policy discussions, for improvement, and in moving us into the future. And P.S. Kane University, I believe, is the only institution of higher learning that has a special designation uh, dealing with urban matters and urban research. Is that fair, Assemblywoman? That, that is fair. And we worked hard uh, through the legislature to support Kane and the president, uh, Dr. Repolette, in making this happen. So we're extremely excited to work with them at this level. Yeah, Dr. Lamont Repolette, who is the former commissioner of education in the state, the president of Kane University, the Watson Institute. Uh, we've been working closely with them dealing with this urban matters series. Assemblywoman, I cannot thank you enough for joining us and kicking off this program. All the best. Thank you. Stay safe. You got it. Without further ado, this is Think Tank. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Adubato. We are honored to once again be joined. It's been too long. Camila Valdez is the prosecutor in Passaic County. Good to see you, Good to be seen, Steve. Good to be seen. Thank you for having me. And let's officially let everyone know, born and raised where? I was born in the Bronx, but raised in Newark. Just trying to clarify that. Always. Uh, yeah, let's let's talk as we actually do this program, Prosecutor Valdez. Uh, President Biden is launching an initiative, a crime initiative. You've read about it. It's actually as we're speaking, he's, I believe he's going to be speaking in Pennsylvania, adding more police, um, talking about more accountability. I'm not sure what that means in terms of the way police handle themselves, and in light of the George Floyd murder on camera, if you will, um, trying to find the balance between more police but also better police who are more accountable. How much sense does that make, A, and B, how hard is it to execute that? It makes all the sense in the world. Um, we, I have the privilege of working with police officers who are doing their level best to secure communities, to make sure that we're, keep, we're keeping safe. But unfortunately, as, as you know, I have also have had to come across police officers that needed to be held accountable. And so as prosecutors, we have a unique responsibility of standing in the gap between the community and the police. And the more police and the more police interaction with the public, the better it is for all of us. And not an easy task. Um, people don't like change. People clamor for change, but they don't want to be changed themselves. But it's a conversation and a work that we have to do every single day. Prosecutor, let me ask you this. Uh, police morale, OK? Yes, there have been horrific incidents, well publicized as they should be. Police need to be scrutinized. These incidents need to be prosecuted. And too many, disproportionate number of black and brown 
people, disproportionately men, have been uh, on, on the wrong end of that kind of police uh, brutality and violence. However, at the same time, police morale at an all-time low. How big a problem is that? Because you want to talk about hiring more police. Who really wants to be a cop these days? Sure. So we just did a, a, a law enforcement career fair at Montclair State. You know, thank you to Montclair State for hosting us. And police morale is at a long, all time low because we don't hear to, we don't hear about good police. We are focused as we should be on police that have gone rogue, that have that have lost a sense of their oath. But there are plenty of police officers that are doing their level best to keep us safe, that are putting their lives on the line that come to work just for the reward of service, public service, we don't emphasize or focus enough on them because we're focused on those that, that have decided that the laws don't apply to them or that somehow they are above the law. So police morale is something that we have to be very conscious of. We have to make sure that we are highlighting the good work that they do and making sure that the public understands that overwhelmingly police are trying to do the right thing in very dangerous circumstances. And so we hear about police, bad police, but there are more good police than there are bad police. And, and our job is to make sure that they feel appreciated, that they feel seen, and that they feel validated because they're trying to go home to their families just like all the rest of us. Prosecutor, let me ask you this. A lot of folks talk about uh, the, the Supreme Court decision on the right to carry a concealed weapon. In your view, what would that mean in New Jersey if more and more people act? Actually, uh, there are estimates that 150, 200,000 more people may be seeking that permit. What would that mean in your view? In, in New Jersey, um, although the Supreme Court um, struck down the New York provision that that had people not having to explain why they needed a gun. In New Jersey, it's not going to change the legal requirements of having to go through the process of applying for a permit, making sure that the, a background check is done. Um, so it just takes away the need to explain why you need a gun. Any Anytime that there is anything that even can remotely uh, lessen the impact of gun control measures in New Jersey, it's always a scary proposition because we are, we, we see that the state is besieged with gun violence. So anytime any of the re those requirements are made easier, certainly if that gives us um, in, in law enforcement, certainly as a prosecutor, it gives me concern because there are too many guns in New Jersey, certainly in my county, to begin with. But the practical effects of it, in New Jersey at least, is that those legal requirements are still going to have to be satisfied. Uh, Camille, let me ask you this. Uh, fentanyl, how big an issue? It's a very big issue. Heroin and fentanyl is what we see in Patterson. And it is more deadly and it is and it is spreading. And so we need to be conscious of, of where that is. And it is a big problem that we have. Certainly we see it in Passaic County, but it's not just in Passaic County. We see it in, in our major cities. So I, I want to follow up on this. Um, people expect government, prosecutor's office, the courts, police to, to, to protect us. And more and more people believe that the court system and the system itself is letting more and more people who have serious mental health issues back out on the street who are committing, and again, disproportionately in New York, you see it, but that's just the microcosm of urban communities across this country. Do you believe that people with serious mental health issues that are not being taken care of or being helped where they should and how they should that they are, in fact, creating even more crime, A, and B, what should we be doing to address it? So it's, it's a combination of mental health. It's a combination of poverty, trauma. People do what they see. Um, and so if you grew up in an environment where violence begets violence, that's, that's natural to you. That's normal to you. So it's, it's a conversation that we need to have about mental illness, but it goes beyond mental illness. It's poverty, it's trauma, it's lack of resources, it's all the social ills that we've been talking about for years. We need to be able to talk about all those things. Obviously, mental health is something that is extraordinarily important to our work. We need to be conscious of it, and we need to be conscious of the fact that Police um, are being called upon to deal with things like mental health, like issues that are really beyond what their training and expertise is, and that it has to be a multi 
disciplinary approach where we have um, th those partnerships that extend beyond law enforcement in, real in order to really be able to address the issue. Got it. I want to ask you about Miranda rights. First of all, explain to everyone, 30 seconds or less, what are our Miranda rights? So Miranda rights are any time that anyone is in police custody and they're being interrogated, potentially about something, uh, an offense that they have committed, they have to be issued Miranda warnings. And Miranda warnings just, you know, as, as we have come to know from television and otherwise, you have the right to remain silent. Anything that you say can uh, may be used against you. So in the recent Supreme Court case, although... Excuse me, the United States Supreme Court ruled on... So did they say we don't have to that cops don't have to give the Miranda rights anymore? No, no, Miranda rights are still protected under the under the new Supreme Court case, but what the case does, it creates um, a situation where if police officers don't issue those, those warnings, an individual cannot sue the police officer. So it creates an immunity, basically, um, for if you don't issue those warnings and a person gives a statement, if the person is later... Um, tried and they're exonerated, they can't come back and sue the police for not issuing those warnings. Real quick before I let you go, do you have any concerns about this ruling? Sir, uh, certainly, it's it's uh, it's one of the the fundamental things that protections and civil and civil rights that we have to ensure that people are making statements and their and their rights are being protected. So if the police don't do that, then you can't sue them. So that that is certainly of concern, but we're going to ensure that our police officers, certainly in Passaic County, are making sure that they are abiding by those Miranda warnings and making sure that the public is protected. You're listening to, uh, and that has been, the prosecutor in Passaic County, Camila Valdez. Prosecutor, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. We'll be right back. To see more Think Tank with Steve Adubato programs and to listen to Think Tank with Steve Adubato, the podcast, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hey, hey, hey! Nothing has ever been handed to me. I've had to work for it. On the field. And off the field. Kane worked with me. Guided me. Helped me climb higher. To get where I belong. To change my life. Hey, welcome to the team. Cougars climb higher. Kane University. We are honored to be joined by the Honorable New Jersey State Assemblywoman Shivanda Sumter, a chair of the Community Development and Affairs Committee and also the president and CEO of Children's Aid and Family Services. Good to see you, Assemblywoman. Great to see you, Steve. Thank you for having me. You got it. Um, listen, we are involved with Kane University in a series called Urban Matters. They have an urban institute there, the John S. Watson Institute, focusing on urban issues, as you know. The most pressing two or three urban issues in the state that we must address are? Wealth disparities between uh, Black residents in the state of New Jersey and Brown residents and non-minority residents. We're upwards of $300,000 in net wealth for a non-Black resident in the state of New Jersey. Um, and it really stems from lack of home ownership, uh, educational opportunities, uh, food insecurities. So really, uh, the Watson Institute has been instrumental in working with the Legislative Black Caucus, in which I'm also the chair of, in highlighting these issues in partnership with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and the Black Mayors Association. So we've doubled down in this space. We're going to uh, pick off a couple issues after this, but to be clear, our colleagues and friends at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, the study that they did in terms of the wealth gap $322,500 for white families versus $17,700 for black families, $26,000 for Latino families. That's the wealth gap we're talking about. It's real. It is real. Real dollars and cents in 2022. Other, is, would you say that crime is one of the top three issues in our urban communities, Assemblywoman? Uh, jobs, it still stems from jobs. 
Steve. So while, while crime um, has risen in the pandemic, mental health issues are also exasperated because of the pandemic, but really jobs and earning a livable wage as we talk about the wealth gap because it creates access to health care, access to education, access to opportunity, which we still continue to fight for those pieces in our urban communities. And it's critical. Child care, our, our initiative, Reimagine Child Care. Uh, you were one of the co-sponsors of the very historic and significant uh, Thriving by Three program, which provides $28 million grant program aimed at expanding availability, improving quality uh, child care, infant child care, uh, toddler child care in New Jersey. Why is that initiative, Thriving by Three, so important? So, Steve, in New Jersey, we want to take care of all of our children. 5,000 infants and toddlers were not attending any child care daycare institution in the pandemic. In fact, some children who were born during that time only know their parents because we were socially isolated for the safety of our loved ones. So coming out of this in child care facilities, we had women primarily as the workforce most impacted by the pandemic by not being open uh, and shut down. So infusing over $28 million in grant programs, it will impact all families and help all our infants and toddlers to learn social skills, to have a safe place to learn and grow while parents may have to go to work um, or take care of other family needs. So it was important that we invested money into this service line of zero to three uh, for early start for safety, health, and wellness of our children in New Jersey. Someone talk to us about gun violence in our urban communities. Um, it's systemic, it's longstanding, and there's no simple solution. What is one policy, one action that must be taken that can at least stem the tide, improve the situation, because it ain't going to get fixed anytime soon? I don't know if there is a fixing, but there has to be a decrease in some significant way, please, Assemblywoman. So as the Legislative Black Caucus, we've done a number of initiatives around gun violence in our communities. Um, one of the ones that I'd love to uplift is partnership with social service entities. Uh, when there's a shooting, wrapping around the entire family. It's not just policing, but it's the trauma uh, post the shooting that hits the family and those impacted in an entire community. We had a horrific loss of a young man who was a senior in high school uh, earlier this year, uh, just delivering groceries to his grandmother. Uh, and the impact in our community was a ripple effect that has a lasting effect. So making sure we have the social support services uh, to support our families during this trauma so that they can uh, find healthy ways to heal. Uh, and that piece is important. And also safe ways to report. If you see something, say something. It's important that we allow our community safe access with our prosecutors to report if they know of a shooter uh, in their communities and neighborhoods. Let's talk concealed weapons. The Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has ruled on a New York case. It will make it, uh, I don't, don't want to say easier, but it's changed the law as it relates to the ability to carry a concealed weapon. New Jersey has certain safeguards, according to some, in terms of how you get that permit to carry a concealed weapon. But what concerns do you have about that United States Supreme Court ruling on concealed weapons and making it, frankly, I'm not going to say easier, but legal in more situations than ever before, please? Steve, I I'm concerned about the access to semi-automatic weapons. So multiple magazine clips, and in New Jersey, we reduce the number of magazine clips that you can have, uh, stamping guns so we know who owns them. Let's take the Buffalo supermarket shooting where they had an armed law enforcement retired uh, person in the supermarket where the person was shooting and had body armor on during a mass shooting uh, of innocent persons. So making some of those pieces illegal that ship mail order uh, to people uh, so that they can cause harm. This is not the military. Military grade style weapons has no place in civilian hands 
to potentially cause harm. And we've had upwards of over 200 mass shootings just this year alone, and we're in the seventh month of the year. Um, it's exhausting. Uh, Uvalde, Texas, uh, the school shooting, it gets you know horrific. Uh, post even Connecticut uh, shooting where New Jersey really went to work on making sure that we put safeguards in place. But we have to have families engaged Right, we have to have registered owners uh, have responsibilities for the sale of their guns, which New Jersey did. So, really putting some smart vehicles in place, uh, and also I'm a proponent of the mental health screenings uh, because you never know when a psychotic episode may occur, and then we're sitting here with someone who has a legal weapon to discharge in an open space for innocent victims. Let me let me try this real quick. Um... The Supreme Court also has made a historic, significant, and some say controversial decision about Roe versus Wade, changing law that's been in existence for 50 plus years. The greatest concern you have, if any, about that Supreme Court decision is? Access to health care. New Jersey has some of the highest rates of maternal uh, mortality in the country. So access to reproductive health care uh, is impacted by this decision. Uh, folks like to just uplift the fact that abortions are now, um, I just can't believe it, uh, that some states, uh, middle of the country, are making it harder to get access to reproductive Excuse health. Excuse me, yeah. someone, it is likely that there'll be 50 plus states that after the Supreme Court decision, U.S. Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade, it is likely that more than half of the states will ban abortion. Again, it depends upon what period of time when a woman is pregnant. The number of weeks. So it's, it's getting complicated for, for people to understand what their rights are, especially if there's a, a compromising pregnancy. Uh, we read recently about a 10-year-old uh, who had to leave her home state who was, in fact, raped by a 29-year-old to have a safe procedure. We're in Indiana, back. she went from Ohio to Indiana. How would that be different in New Jersey? Because New Jersey, through the governor and the legislature, have quote unquote codified the legal right to abortion. What does that exactly mean? So it means that you can come to New Jersey and have a safe procedure and that we will not uh, extradite you back to your home state. We will protect the privacy because this is also a health privacy issue of the woman and the choices that she chooses to make, or of the female, let me say it that way, uh, versus of the woman, of the female. It's 30 million women and girls impacted by the Roe v. Wade decision that the court made, 30 million. New Jersey Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, chair of the Community Development Affairs Committee, also the chair of the Black Caucus in the state legislature. Assemblywoman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You got to stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more Think Tank with Steve Adubato programs and to listen to Think Tank with Steve Adubato, the podcast, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Nothing has ever been handed to me. I've had to work for it. On the field. And off the field. Kane worked with me. Guided me. Helped me climb higher. To get where I belong. To change my life. Hey, welcome to the team. Cougars climb higher. Kane University. We're now joined by Nancy Holacek, Executive Vice President, Chief Nursing Officer at RWJ Barnabas Health, one of the significant underwriters of public broadcasting, including our production company. Nancy, um, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. Make the connection between human trafficking and the healthcare system, but also nurses in particular, please. Absolutely. So uh, human trafficking is a global and local issue. And uh, if, if you don't mind me uh, just quoting a couple of percentages, uh, globally, it's about um, 20, approximately 25 million folks 
are, um, are trafficked globally. And uh, one in four of those are children, 71% are women or girls, and 29% are men or boys. And um, of, the, of that 25 million, um, in New Jersey, uh, unfortunately, we have the 13th highest call volume in the United States and ninth, where we are ninth in the US for reported cases. Uh, the link between those numbers that I just shared, human trafficking, um, and our healthcare system and our nurses and clinicians in particular, uh, is because at least 80%, if not a little bit more, um, of those victims who are trafficked do seek health care while they're being trafficked. 63% um, seek health care in an emergency department, and others may seek health care in a dental office or for substance abuse, you know, various other um, environments. And so uh, there is absolutely the opportunity for our nurses and our clinicians um, to be the first point of contact for those that are most vulnerable uh, and to make that connection. But, but Nancy, help us understand this. First of all, I, I didn't even make the connection in my own mind between victims of human trafficking and the healthcare system. But what is the responsibility of a clinician, particularly a nurse, a, a physician, but, but, but a nurse, who, as we know, nurses often deal more directly with patients. What exactly could, could and should they do, Nancy? Well, it first really starts with raising awareness, Steve, and education. And so um, partnering with state agencies and, and uh, making sure we have great uh, relationships and partnerships with our local law enforcement, making sure that um, there's bi-directional education around this particular issue, um, providing our staff, our clinicians and our staff with uh, the appropriate tools, evidence-based tools to screen, um, to be um, aware and sensitive to folks that come in that may be acting a little bit differently, either um, looking for emotional signs or for physical signs of, of abuse. And so, again, because the, these victims are seeking health care, uh, and we are, as you said, um, usually probably the first uh, person that, that sees them, it is really our, our opportunity to, to intervene. And um, when I say intervene, I say that um, not in an aggressive way or an assertive way, um, in a very sensitive way. So this is a sensitive subject, sensitive issue, and... Um, need to approach it cautiously and sensitively. But, but real quick on this, Nancy, but many of these victims, if not all of them, are incredibly fearful of the potential reprisal of someone helping them and it be known that they asked for help or accepted help. It's complicated, is it not? It's very complicated, Steve, and, and no doubt they are, they are I'm, I'm certain, fearful. Um, we have heard stories from survivors and um, we may not make we may not make a referral on the first connection. We may just start a relationship with that victim. Um, but but that's why I say we we approach it cautiously, sensitively, um, applying the the evidence based tools and the um, assessments that we know, and then gently approaching the subject in a private, um, safe location for that, that potential victim, asking questions, just some, something as simple as, do you need help? Are you okay? And um, letting them take it from there, giving them the power to make that decision at that time or seek us in the future. Hey, uh, Nancy, thank you so much. All the best to you and the team. Thank you, Steve. And all, well. also thank you to all the extraordinary nurses out there who never get enough attention. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, care. Nancy. I'm thank Steve Adubato. Thank you. Well, we'll see you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Kane University, the Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care, TD Bank, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Choose New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by AM970 The Answer and by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network. Hey, hey, hey. Nothing has ever been handed to me. I've had to work for it. On the field. And off the field. Kane worked with me, guided me, 
Help me climb higher. To get where I belong. To change my life. Hey, welcome to the team. Cougars climb higher. Kane University.